Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, welcome, everyone, this afternoon to Hudson. It's quite a big crowd, I have to say. I'm surprised in the middle of summer. Everyone must be very hot and be seeking some air conditioning. But I think the topic actually is very interesting, and I appreciate you being here. Um, today we're going to talk about um, the intersection, essentially, of economics and national security, uh, thinking about competition, as you all know, across the economic, political, military domains. And we're going to focus specifically today on the economic side of things. We're fortunate to have Anthony Vinci here. He's an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for New American Security and a former associate director for capabilities and the chief technology officer of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, known as NGA. In that capacity, Anthony was responsible for technology, R&D, procurement, budgeting, and the strategy of the agency overall. Uh, he also was responsible for bringing AI into the agency, which is quite an accomplishment, as many of you know who work in government, to get government to, to think and adopt AI more effectively. Previously, he was the CEO of two technology startups, and he served with the Department of Defense in Iraq, Afghanistan, um, I think Afghanistan, right? Asia. Asia, Asia, sorry, and Africa. He has a PhD in international relations at the London School of Economics. And actually, you know, we need more of Anthony in, in the government. And the intersection of economics uh, and national security is really what he's been about in his whole career. And I look forward to hearing his comments today. I'll ask a couple of questions after his comments to start things off. And then I'll open it up to the audience. And we'll end at about 4 o'clock. Thank you. Can you hear me? How's the sound? Good. Thanks so much, Nadia, and thanks to the Hudson Institute for having me here today and for um, discussing this topic. I think it's one of the most important topics uh, confronting our nation um, today. I wanted to spend some time today talking a bit about the economic threat uh, from China and in general to the nation, and then what that threat means for the American military and intelligence. Um, and then I have a fairly specific proposal that I'd that I'd like to talk about to begin improving our economic defenses in the country. So there's an increasing recognition that the current national security competition with China, and some are referring to this as a, as a new Cold War, is as much economic as military. The economic nature of this Cold War is new for America. We haven't faced a competitor with anywhere near the economic power that we have since the British. Uh, nor have we ever faced a competitor which has the innovative economic agility which we pride ourselves on. And this economic competition is going to require that, that we have fundamentally new ways of thinking about defense and intelligence and national security. Chinese GDP is on track to surpass America's. As measured by purchasing power parity, it's already there. Such a large economy in itself provides China with an advantage in national security because it simply has more money with which to buy, develop, and implement defense and intelligence systems. But more importantly, in my view, is that the Chinese are better able to orchestrate their economic instruments for geopolitical purposes because they hardly recognize the divide between public and private. Chinese Communist Party is able to use its control over all government agencies and influence over commercial industry to direct investment where it's needed for national security purposes. This allows China to perceive national security competition in areas such as artificial intelligence, and then to direct economic actors to develop in that particular industry. It also means that China can have concentrated geopolitical power plays like Belt and Road Initiative, which combine government and commercial economic instruments. Moreover, China is much more willing than Western democracies to use their security apparatuses to support economic growth, such as through the systematic illegal or sometimes quasi-illegal theft of foreign intellectual property. This creates a virtuous circle in which the government can help business expand and dominate industries and then use those businesses to expand government geopolitical power. The spectrum of Chinese economic competition has already led to real threats, in my view. Chinese attempts to become the world leader in certain technologies, such as artificial intelligence, translate directly to military intelligence capabilities. 
installation of Huawei 5G systems in partner nations caused real concerns for, the, for our intelligence advantage because China would have um, access to potentially privileged communication between the US and allied countries. Already, China venture investments in promising US startup companies have the effect of taking those companies off the table for use by the military and intelligence community by making it impossible for those companies to obtain security clearances or to contract with the government in certain areas. So even minority investments that didn't hit the CFIUS level can still, for some agencies, create an impact, as an example. And Belt and Road initiatives, such as de facto control of reports, provide China with strategic advantages in any geopolitical or military clashes. At a more strategic level, BRI threatens to change the global alliance landscape. And finally, systematic theft of US military secrets from contractors provide a means for China to threaten or copy US weapon systems, thereby neutralizing US capabilities. So I think these are real threats, and I think many in the room have heard of them, and something for us to be concerned about. And America cannot adequately compete with China without first better understanding and then being able to act upon the economic dimension of power. Well, American competition with China may have arms races over artificial intelligence instead of missile systems like we did in the last Cold War. It's still going to involve the same jockeying for geopolitical advantage as, as we had with the Soviet Union. However, economic warfare is going to be a much larger part in this Cold War. I would see this increasingly common understanding of the layout of a new Cold War and actually take it a step further. I think in my view, the global economy has, in effect, become a new war fighting domain. So like land, sea, undersea, air, space, cyber, the economic domain is a landscape upon which conflicts will be executed. Understanding it as such allows us to apply the usual concepts of war fighting, so command and control, intelligence, offense and defense, and importantly, provides the ability to jointly integrate across other domains. China is already thinking this way. So for example, in the recently released white paper, China's National Defense in a New Era, it's noted that supporting the sustainable development of the country is one of the chief national defense aims. So this kind of thinking has already sunk in. As with any domain of war, the first step is understanding the topography and the threat itself. However, in the economic domain, our national security system is at a distinct disadvantage in that understanding. Because we haven't we've so far considered this to be a civilian domain. We don't have the people or the expertise or the organizations to gain understanding in our national security community when it comes to economic threats. The national security community's knowledge of and ability to analyze the global economic simply system is just simply, it's not sufficient. And I'd say that based on my experience in the intelligence community and in finance, our capabilities aren't even in the same league as some relatively tiny hedge funds. It's that much of a difference. And that should concern all of us. Most US economic analysis efforts are directed towards countering terrorism threat finance networks. And this is largely irrelevant when it comes to strategic threats in the economy. Moreover, the little information that the US government does have is not widely shared, nor is the information used adequately for actually countering the threats, generally due to concerns about authorities and the, the role of government. So the state of affairs kind of reminds me of when Secretary of State Henry Stimson said that gentlemen don't read each other's mail, and then went and shut down the Cipher Bureau. America just doesn't do economic espionage or economic warfare. Whether it's a gentlemanly thing or whether it's that we have legitimate philosophical differences when it comes to the role of government in the economy, whatever it is, the fact is that we're not doing it, it pre prevent, presents us with a real disadvantage. But it's not too late. When new threats have arisen in the past, America has made the changes to its national security structure to counter those threats. After Simpson, America did create the OSS to pursue World War II. 
National Security Act of 1947 set up America for a new form of competition with the Soviet Union through the creation of the Secretary of Defense, the Air Force, and the CIA. And these organizations were necessary to combat a new enemy where, for example, air power and intelligence would be key determinants of success, and there were new domains of war fighting. Similarly, after 9-11, we created the Department of Homeland Security, the Terrorism Threat Integration Center, and eventually the National Counterterrorism Center to, as means to pursue the war on terror. Existing agencies are a start, but they're not sufficient. The National Economic Council is not well set up for national security threats. While the CIA and other intelligence agencies may be able to perform economic analysis, they're not open enough and don't have the necessary public-private partnerships that you would need to adequately address economic threats. The Office of Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes, or similar offices throughout the government, are too narrowly focused on threat finance. While that's necessary, it is, it's not sufficient for strategic threats. We require new capabilities to fight in the economic domain and to defend against economic threats. And I would propose one first step. To counter economic threats and to begin the process of treating the global economy as a warfighting domain, America requires a National Economic Defense Center which would provide a place for the government to coordinate and accelerate its economic threat analysis and responses. The center would be parallel in many ways to the National Counterterrorism Center, the NCTC. As with NCTC, it would create a whole of government approach, even potentially a whole of nation approach, bringing together multiple agencies and departments, each with its own subject matter expertise, their own missions, and their own authorities. In effect, the NEDC, the Economic Defense Center, would maintain the equivalent of a real-time operations center for the global economy, monitoring, sharing information about economic threats from China and other competitors, and di directing responses to those threats. The member agencies would exchange, compile, compare, and analyze economic threat information, connecting dots which are not connected right now. Our current authorities to defend against economic threats are spread throughout the government. Due to compartmentalization along domestic versus foreign, law enforcement versus intelligence, civilian versus military splits. As with the counterterrorism fight, the NCTC's ability to combine multiple authorities by having different agencies all at the table and in the same room. In the same way, an economic defense center must combine different authorities and bring all the players into the same room and sit at the same table. Actions to counter threats would be coordinated across these multiple agencies and across law enforcement agencies and across national security authorities. The Economic Defense Center would provide the president with a single responsible party when it comes to developing policies to counter economic threats. The Economic Defense Center would also accelerate our economic analytical capability through increasing training tools and private industry experience. As I've mentioned before, we just simply don't have that kind of expertise in the government at the level that we need it. And we need a place where people can learn how to do that and where they can attract those kinds of people and they can communicate. We need to build up that capability. It means having government employees who can understand how to use a Bloomberg terminal who have studied economic history and business strategy as much as current intelligence analysts have studied military history or Arabic language. And we need a place where these ex experts can go and be trained and where they, importantly, can communicate seamlessly across their agency boundaries and develop themselves into a world-class economic analysis capability. It won't be easy to do this. As I've personally seen in trying to bring data scientists and similar technologists into the government, there's a lot of competition out there for certain skill sets. And I would say it's the same for economic analysis and financial skills. And the government human resources system just simply doesn't make it easy to bring new people in who have, new, who have these experiences. I mean, when you think about it, how will we convince someone who's making over a million dollars a year in Connecticut or in New York City 
working in finance to come move to Northern Virginia and take a GS-15 salary. And especially if it means that they have to do things like divest from significant investments in their lives. So I have no doubt that we will be able to convince people to come, just purely out of patriotism and a feel and a need to do a mission. But we do need to be more flexible in bringing them in and figure out ways to do this. Finally, and I think maybe most importantly, having a center will help to remove the stigma of in economic intelligence. It will help longtime Cold Warriors and counterterrorism experts realize that economic intelligence is a le legitimate area of intelligence collection and analysis, and that economic threats are real and need to be confronted like threats in any other warfighting domain. The natural home, I think, for such a center would be jointly between the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and the Department of Treasury, although I can imagine other scenarios. No matter what, representatives of the intelligence community, military, and law enforcement agencies would need to play major roles in such a center. And given the wide range of our economy and departments and agencies, ranging from USDA to FAA to SEC, would all need to have representation. Most revolutionarily, the Economic Defense Center would require a true public-private partnership bringing in people and expertise from commercial industry to work together with government. This PPP would encompass information and threat sharing as well as an ability to actively defend US industry. Could even potentially imagine points of active or preemptive defense for some of these companies. It's only a matter of time before an American commercial company realizes that their biggest competitor is not just another company that they're companies that are backed by nation states. And com competing with a, a nation state backed company is not the same as competing with other companies because such a company has the potential for nation state level financial and legal and security resources. They're able to cheat, in essence. China is perfectly willing to forego profit for geoeconomic gain, I think is something we've already seen when it comes to state-owned companies and even non-state-owned companies. This is something that US companies simply cannot do. And I think in this scenario, executives at such companies will come to realize that they'll have to have a closer relationship with government, just as they have already for issues like cybersecurity. So this PPP should involve companies, banks, investors, and other commercial institutions, as well as academia, think tanks, and FFRDCs. This isn't a whole of government challenge. Economic defense is, that, is something that's going to require a whole of nation approach. Finally, the global nature of economic domain demands cooperation with foreign allies. Five Eyes should immediately be invited into the center. And from there, I can envision many other allies joining. With an economic defense center in place, the US national security community would be better placed to respond to many of the economic threats presented by China and other countries. This could include contributing information and analysis to block transaction under CFIUS, for example, providing integrated plans to strategically direct foreign aid, and supporting law enforcement in the prosecution of IP theft or similar crimes, or supporting proactive US economic counters to foreign nation state threats, such as strategic technology investments or backing key telecommunications or other information, other infrastructure projects. So new threats require new defenses. Economic threats mount in a new Cold War, and America requires a center to be able to defend against them. Just as we've already created a joint artificial intelligence center, the Jake, is it, in order to address one threat, an economic defense center is another organization that we can create in order to, str to strengthen our economic security analysis and to provide a whole of nation approach to our defense. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. That was really interesting, and I hope you found it as interesting as I did. Um, I think, you know, the couple of things that I really like about Anthony's talk and his ideas 
First, he's re-emphasizing the importance of national security and economic security and the intertwined nature of the two, something that I think this administration has done well over the past two years. I think Anthony pointed out that both communities need to understand that about each other, especially on the econ side of things and the national security side as well. Second, I think he brought up one of the most fundamental issues that we all need to think about. How do we create the best operational models to compete in the world that we find ourselves in? How does a market economy compete with a state-driven um, economy like China's and other countries? Uh, what new models are needed? What new capabilities are needed? And I think Anthony's points, his specific idea, is a really good starting point for discussion, right? A lot of times in Washington, we describe the nature of the problem, describe the landscape, but we lack specific policy recommendations. So while his specific idea might be open to criticism, and certainly there are probably issues related to the nature of the sharing of information with the private sector and the government and other issues you'll bring up, I like the specificity of it because it's a great starting point for debate and discussion. So with that, um, I'll ask two questions and then I'll open it up. The first essentially is the broader point about are we really in a Cold War? Uh, Anthony used that point early on in his talk and I think it's debatable, um, possibly. I think there are probably two sides to that. Is that uh, you know, too strong of a phrase to describe what we're seeing today? So I might ask Anthony to comment on that. It's a really good question um, and I've been of two minds about it um, for a while now. Cold War is probably the closest term in common usage for what the conflict is today in the sense that it is, it is more than just the normal competition between two nation states um, and, and achievement of absolute gains. There is an attempt at relative gains versus um, between two com countries that can be zero sum and can involve more than just the normal and I would say legal means of that kind of competition. And once you go outside of the legal means and you start to use um, espionage um, and strategic means, you start to enter that world of a Cold War. The, the question is, will it also move into physical conflict and potentially via proxies? And that would certainly um, start to look much more like a Cold War. Um, until then, I think it's essentially the best term that we have. Thank you. And I'm sure you in the audience probably have different ideas on that. And feel free to, um, to comment if you'd like. Uh, a second question is essentially, is the economy as a warfighting domain realistic? I like to think about for years now, we've talked about public-private sector cooperation to deal with cyber threats, for instance, and how difficult it's been getting both sides to share the kinds of information necessary to really improve our defenses in certain areas. So given the problem sets we've had in that domain, um, how do you see sort of that necessary information sharing unfolding? Yeah, um, so kind of two issues, one on is whether whether warfighting domain is really an appropriate way to refer to this. And the reason that I went so far as to say that is I think domain captures the extent to which the competition and conflict takes place. And where all the way at the tactical level, there are economic issues that would confront even small units of soldiers, for example. So you can imagine in a place like Afghanistan, where we have troops on the ground, um, economic issues are not typically something that come into play in people's thinking, but actually are very relevant. So as that conflict goes, and as we potentially begin to pull all the way out of that country, um, there is the possibility of China or other states coming in and using economic means to gain support and allies at a local level and eventually at a national level, and then to use that for political and geopolitical purposes. And so all of a sudden, what's happening in a small village, and whether you leave behind a defended village with a functioning economy or not, and whether that they're happy and able to take care of themselves, have potentially strategic level effects. And you can go up through tactical and operational and strategic levels all the way to the president, who has to think about um, things like tariffs and, and things like 
um, economic agreements, not just from the perspective of um, our usual um, economic thinking, but also from a national security perspective. And so it's that connection all the way from tactical to strategic and to grand strategy that makes me think it's a domain, and also that the tools themselves are, are spread across that domain and the actors are spread across within our, our government. And so it reminds me most of how we treat cyber and how we treat some of the other domains, and that's why I propose that way of referring to it. In terms of public-private partnerships and how to cooperate with industry, this is probably the hardest um, part of thinking about um, economic defense, economic threats, um, war fighting in, a, in an economic domain, because we, at the end of the day, are a capitalist economy, and we do have a separation between the government and um, the economic sector and commercial and industry sectors. Um, and I think fundamentally, it's that capitalist system that is our greatest advantage. I think in the end, it's going to be the thing that will ensure ultimate success um, across every domain. So how do we make that balance of keeping that system in place and ensuring that we kind of hold true to it, um, but also supporting it in, in the face of economic threats? And, and to go back to one of the things I said, when you have a situation where a company, a private company, is having to compete not just with other companies, but competing against a nation state. How do you do that effectively? Um, and and um, so still maintaining that, that, that separation between the government and a company and ensuring those companies are treated fairly by the government, don't have any favoritism, um, are, are able to compete in an open playing field, but also supporting them. And where can we do that? And, and there are examples of this already happening where we provide um, cybersecurity or other security information in which to defend them or provide surfaces like that. And I think what I'm proposing is extending that kind of thinking um, to other ways that the government can support. And particularly, I would say, in, in industries that are closer in to national security needs. Um, and ensuring, for example, that, that certain investments from um, foreign companies don't um, threaten um, U.S. national security industries, but even in industries that we don't typically associate with um, national security, there might also be um, similar threats. And as an example, I would use something like executive search, um, an industry that probably most people wouldn't consider a national security industry um, but is highly relevant um, in that talent in technology companies is the number one driver of success. And if an ex executive search co company was compromised in some way and un unable to effectively move talent around, track talent, or if information about talent was um, being extracted from those companies, for example, that provides a, a threat to the technology industry and then ultimately to national security. So gives you an idea of how these um, industries that we don't typically associate with national security and think of something that we need to defend actually do have to be defended. Thank you. Thanks. I mean, another way of thinking about it, um, because war fighting, uh, sometimes it's, it's hard to build coalitions around that term where it might be specific, would be a domain of sustained competition. So to retain America's competitive advantages, we need to see this domain as one of sustained competition. And that might cover more of an area. But that's something, you know, the nice, the nice thing about specific ideas is you can continue to have these debates as they're refined. So I'll open it up uh, to questions. Uh, if possible, if you could just introduce yourself quickly or at least say where you're from, that's often he uh, helpful. So I'll go here to the gentleman in beige. In military terms, a good defense, the a good offense is what is needed for a good defense, and you have economic defense center. But uh, going on the offense, we can begin to see that uh, there's a paradigm problem in the world, two competing paradigms, capitalism on the one hand and collectivism, communism, socialism all forms of collectivism. Now, the offense 
was developed back in 58 by someone who wrote a book countering Karl Marx. It was called the Capitalist Manifesto. Mm -hmm. But the word capitalist was, was, was not a good idea. That, that is because in capitalism, we don't have the kind of democracy that would be demanded by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, Section 17, which says that every person should have the right to be able to become an owner of, uh, of, of property personally as well as in association with others. Kelso and Buckminster Fuller and other people from the 20th century are saying the same thing. We have to enable, lift the barriers. And Kelso's books, his two books, outline how to do that. And, and, and this became the basis for ownership, starting with workers. We, we need a, quest, we a question. Had, under President Reagan, we got the laws, a presidential task force on Project Economic Justice, which we wrote the laws. And he was very favorable. And so anybody who's interested in the new paradigm, which is based on limited government, free markets, private property, but it, it would add what, was, what, what no country in the world has yet done is a monetary system and a tax system which would encourage universal access, not only for people in, in, in one country, the United States could take the lead on this, and I know that in- Yes, sir, we need, we need a, que a question specifically. So the question is, should we be seeking uh, an offense based on universal citizen ownership beyond the vote to ownership? Um, I, I would say a couple of things to, to answer. One is um, there's a clear ideological difference here, and it's another one of the reasons why, why Cold War is maybe an appropriate way to refer to it between the individual and a, and a collective view of society um, and, and, and capitalism being the, the natural economic system if you hold the individual as paramount. And, um, so at that, at that, at that level, um, there, there is a cold war over ideas. And economics will be core to that. Um, and then that. Um, the other thing I would say, um, to your point of whether we need an offense, um, again, I would think of this in the same way as any other warfighting domain or area of competition. And there will be offense and there will be defense. Um, but there will be, in essence, rules of engagement and levels of the conflict and competition. Um, I think it's in all countries' interests to stay at the lowest possible level of competition um, for as long as possible, um, which typically means a defensive nature. Um, but I do think in systems like an economic defense center and other organizations, when you start to think about these things, um, policymakers um, and national security experts will have to make the call of what the right balance is at any given time. OK, the gentleman up front here. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Chris Orr, current DOD contractor, former Air Force officer, and former DHS. And oh, by the way, my time at DHS included three years with US Customs and Border Protection at the Los Angeles Long Beach Seaport. I inspect a lot of China shipping and Costco cargo vessels, so I kind of witnessed firsthand the kind of economic warfare China is engaging in. That said, let me cut to the question. Uh, last week at the Heritage Foundation, they had an interesting panel talking about our budding 5G networks and how PRC companies like Huawei and ZTE that have that state uh, you know, corporate connection, how they pose a threat for 5G networks. One more interesting nuggets the panelists mentioned is that there are some recent evidence that Huawei might have actually violated some of the sanctions against North Korea, which, if true, would show a pretty uh, egregious intertwining of economic and military threats. Just wondering if either one of you have heard any more details about what specific sanctions are violated or what Huawei might have done to uh, you know, vi violate these sanctions against the DPRK. 
Thank you. I, I yeah, other than news reports, um, you know, that have been out there, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't know either, but one thing I would say is that um, things like breaking economic sanctions are already within the system in that we have organizations in place in order to track and monitor these things and prosecute them. And I think what's lacking, again, is um, when they become more sophisticated than that and um, strategic actions by countries that don't blatantly break a sanction but otherwise provide a threat, and then how do we ensure that we're able to respond to those, which often slip through the cracks because um, intelligence analysts and others who are charged with that don't realize even that they're happening or aren't, aren't able to put the pieces together. I think to Anthony's point, what tools and what sort of what's in the toolkit of economic statecraft, right? We often just think about sanctions, but a center like this could work, uh, you know, in much more detail thinking through those tools. Um, the young lady behind us. Thank you. Uh, Marina Haig, Department of Commerce, Office of Space Commerce. Uh, so I actually have two questions. Uh, first of all, what do you see as the next steps towards establishing an NEDC? And then do you see potential international repercussions from declaring the economy as a warfighting domain? Um, in terms of the next steps, it can go two routes through, through Congress or through the President. Um, I, I think bringing attention to the issue is really the next step and realizing that there is a problem and realizing that the current organizations in the government um, are not adequately equipped um, to respond to the threat. Um, similar in many ways to the, to the background of um, the creation of the NCTC. Um, and once that is realized, I think there will be other solutions. And this, this is the one, again, that I propose that I, I think is um, um, the right way to do it. But there may be other ways um, that can ultimately address the same problems, which is this um, separation of authorities and lack of economic analytical capability. In terms of the designation as a warfighting domain and the repercussions that can come from that, that's a real question that should, should be addressed. Um, in many ways, I think it has already happened by default and as a de facto situation um, where we have competitors that already treat it as such and have similar such offices and ways of acting. Um, and in many parts of the government, here, we're already starting to do that as well. And so um, bringing a name to something that is a de facto reality um, does call attention to it, but at the end of the day isn't changing something that's already real. Um, and so there would need to be a communication strategy um, behind that. And I think as part of that, it would be important for people to realize that there are real um, there's real harm, um, just like in any other warfighting domain, when this competition happens. People are actually harmed. Um, and I suspect you can look at even things like um, health and well-being of people that are affected by um, economic threats that occur. And you could, you could probably even talk about lives lost and things like that, although that's a little different than how we would normally consider economics, but you can look at other harms that befall the nation um, in terms of national security areas. And so um, reminding people that this is a real thing, there, there are real threats, there um, are, is real harm that's occurring, and it is a de facto state of affairs, I think would be an important part of that. And in some ways, it's sort of akin to just, just thinking when we talk about threats to our banking system, right? And uh, the discussions we've had uh, about that, the possibilities of cyber threats to bring down our financial system. Is that an act of war or not? These are kinds of issues that we've been talking about now for several years. So it is, you know. And information operations right. and threats is another example. And I, I think is generally considered to be an area of, of threat and, and conflict in many ways, and is equally, if not more, sensitive for the West when you talk about it as a threat because of fears of censorship and things like this. But there was harm that was happening, and we had to start treating it as a real issue. Other questions? Uh, the gentleman up here. Next. 
Oh, uh, you with the baseball hat, yes. Good afternoon. My name is Julian Kyle Lewis from the illustrious Howard University here in Washington. Um, the potential vulnerabilities that you uh, mapped out um, with your remarks um, open up a realm of possibility where we could have a scenario where uh, a small group of people could decide to um, carry out a cyber attack on a major corporation that the U.S. government is uh, in business dealings with, having legal documents and everything. And if something happened, then the president would have to respond to that at, at an executive level with his cabinet having a meeting and sitting down and discussing what happened and the potential ramifications from voters and the constituency that voted for the president. So if we have that scenario and those a small group of people could offer you a solution to a problem that they started to try to get a contract from the government to correct a cyber attack that you're not sure um, that they're behind, how can you as the President of the United States guarantee that you're not siphoning out contracts to companies who are masking what they're actually uh, intending? Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I didn't really get into it in the talk, but I think one of the points you're bringing up is the um, ethical dilemmas and the potential for conflict of interest that would go into any um, partnership and cooperation between the government and a private company. Um, and I think that's a real concern. I, I really think that is something we would have to be extremely careful about. Um, and that already comes up in things like, if you think about federal acquisition regulation, the FAR, where you just have thousands of pages of documentation trying to figure out how to walk those um, ethical um, boundaries in order to ensure free and open competition and things like that. I suspect we would need um, similar thinking um, for how to do this and, and how to actually implement something that, again, makes this balance of ensuring the continuation of kind of free and open economic capitalist system, but all, is also able to defend that system. Um, and I think a big part of that would be that debate of um, where those lines should be drawn and how we should do that. And we've had this debate in the past in our country before, and even um, having intelligence agencies or even having um, federal law enforcement, for example, were, were, were similar debates in the past because there were things that we didn't have as a nation. So I suspect we'll have that, we would need to have that similar debate and be very careful. My personal preference would be to err on the side of caution um, and, and to accept um, some more um, potential loss of security in order to ensure that that system remains sound um, and ethical. Um, but I still think we can do that by, by having a system in place and having an organization like this. Yes, in the back. Hello? Oh, there you go. Hi. So regarding the Trans-Pacific Partnership, many have argued that the trade deal would have served a geographic purpose, namely to um, you know, reduce dependency on China's trading with uh, certain countries in the area and bring them closer to the United States, uh, Singapore and some Vietnam, some of these other countries that are part of that specific economic area. Do you think that we as a country made a mistake by pulling out of that agreement? And should it be revisited if so? Um, that's a good question. I would say rather than comment on the specific um, agreement there, I would comment more generally on um, economic and, and trade agreements. Um, and I think the paradigm that we're moving into is one where um, it's a blurry line between what is an economic and a trade agreement and what is a, a national security focused agreement or even an alliance and how that will work. And again, um, I think we remain relatively ill-equipped in order to kind of make the right trade-offs there and to think about in a holistic way and within the government all of those trade-offs because 
how to again balance the the economic ramifications with the security ramifications and to think at a very high strategic level about what makes sense both from an economic perspective and from a national security perspective when it comes to um, making these these alliances. I can imagine a world in which um, alliances which in the past, things like NATO, for example, which were only military focused, I can imagine a future world in which we have um, military, political, economic agreements in place and where both all those issues are joined together. Like that would be a potential scenario um, and where um, countries are, are willing to um, make the trade-offs themselves. So they, some countries may have more of a national security military concern and willing to, to make some trade-offs for economic reasons or vice versa. Um, and we would have to take part in those kinds of, um, in those kinds of um, negotiations um, and debates within our own country about what we really want. Um, the other thing I would comment on is what's interesting to think about in any sort of new Cold War, again, if that's the right term to use, um, is that there will be a um, shakeup and a redistribution of what the alliance footprint should be and what's necessary to kind of pursue um, pursue that that Cold War. And there's discussion um, in in basically every op-ed column in the country right now about whether there might be a decoupling with China, whether there would be bifurcation, whether there would be um, um, changes in the alliance footprint, and and um, I think that's going to be um, a significant part um, of the early stages of this competition, just as it was the early stages of the competition with the Soviet Union after World War II. Um, and again, I would say we need the right tools in place to make those right decisions, because the early moves um, and alliances that will be formed may stick around for decades and, and have very long-term effects um, on, on the national security footprint. Thank you. Uh, there's a, a question up here. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Katie Wang with NTD TV. Um, we know that right now we are already in this trade war with China. And just today, uh, President also announced additional 10% tariff on China's uh, $300 million uh, goods. So I'm just wondering, uh, what do you think? Uh, do you think that we're doing so far so good in this trade war? Or um, are we achieving what we wanted? Or any suggestions uh, we can do better? Um, I'm not sure, um, and I, I would say it's um, just from this, uh, my personal point of view, it's too early to tell. Um, um, but again, just to kind of reinforce a, a point that I was just saying, um, in order to even determine that, are, are we winning, are we doing good, those, to answer those kinds of questions, we need new frameworks and ways to think about it, not just from um, are we doing well um, economically, but to also consider some of the national security and other kind of strategic ramifications and um, do that in, in a structured and systematic way. And um, so I think um, organizations like a, like a center like I'm proposing would help to do that. And I would add that if the objective of the um, part, part of the process of the, the trade war is to highlight uh, what's been happening over the past several years, many years now, um, with China in terms of its lack of openness to US businesses, in terms of IP theft, in terms of everything we've seen, then yes, it's actually moving toward achieving those objectives. The conversation today is very different than it was five years ago. And I would argue that it's a necessary conversation that we're having. So um, any more questions? Question, uh, OK, two questions in the back, one and then Hi, I'm Kevin Virgil, and I'm a concerned local citizen. And I just wanted to throw out a theory out there that I don't think that our like America's greatest economic threat is China. Um, <clears throat> I don't think personally that any country that can't allow its currency to free flow could be considered a superpower. But I'd love to get your thoughts on that. But more importantly, I think that America's greatest asset is its 
is the dollar status as, as global reserve currency. And our greatest economic threat is anything or any coordinated action to chip away at that market share, for lack of a better term, in global, at global uh, money flows. So you're starting to see more and more signs of that happening. Um, so far, the petrodollar seems to be uh, 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 fairly stable and reliable um, in terms of maintaining our, our status. But there's a lot happening between China and Russia right now. Um, increasingly with India, and I'd just love to get your thoughts as to whether or not that is something that we should be more concerned about, maybe even an issue for this proposed forum to consider. Yeah. A um, cu couple of things that I would say. Um, one is that I actually am tempted to agree with you sometimes, that, um, or I would say it like this, actually, that China is not the only economic threat to the country. I know during my remarks, I. Um, heavily leaned upon China as kind of the foil, um, as you might say, in terms of economic threats. But there are economic threats from lots of nation states and from some non-state actors in the world. And when I think about an economic defense center and I think about economic defenses for the nation, I would say that's for all, um, all forms of threat. Um, and that is an important um, kind of consideration. And I think you kind of alluded to that there, there, there might be multiple countries working together, for example, either consciously or um, just systematically without even um, actually having alliances to do that for their own reasons, and that that would still present a threat and would still be something that we would um, at least want to be able to analyze and understand um, from a security perspective for, for the nation. Um, in terms of issues about um, the dollar standard, um, I would say that it is another example of the um, threat po profile when it comes to economic threats. And you sort of start to think about what is the, the scope and the depth of the issues that uh, a country would, would address. Um, that is one of them. I fear that it is a good example of an issue that we're um, particularly bad at thinking about um, in our intelligence community and in um, the agencies that are responsible for thinking about these things. Um, it it's, it's, it's takes a significant amount of understanding of the global economy to understand how that works, the dollar standard, what the other options are out there what the pros and cons would be for changing it in one way or the another, and what the even the means of doing that would be. Some of that understanding does exist in places like Treasury Department or in, in, in the Fed and places like that. But again, these organizations aren't necessarily communicating with each other. And again, it just calls attention for me back to the issue of um, them communicating with each other and sharing some of the authorities and being in the same room together. And that's the kind of footprint that we need to have. So you've, your question has spurred the first work agenda item of such a, such a center. Um, gentlemen, yep. Good afternoon. Uh, PJ Makish, Senior Military Fellow, National Defense University. Anthony, let's grant the argument completely, grant it outright and say, if the president said to you, I don't want to create another organization or another bureaucracy, could you argue for doing it under the neck? And if so, what would you need to do to transform it besides the intelligence piece you've been touching on? Next yeah. is the National Economic Council. Yep. Um, absolutely. I, I, I think there are other organizational options. And again, I, I propose something fairly specific, as Nadia was saying, which is not the norm, um, or is the norm from people who have been in the government and tried to push things through in the past, I guess. And. Um, I think it could be done by um, reforming or changing or adding um, new authorities to existing organizations. Um, the NEC would, in fact, be one of the ones that I would also point out as, as a possible place to do it. Um, it, it works well because of um, its kind of neutral status um, in terms of some of the other agencies and departments and because of the general strategic level of its thinking. It already has a lot of the economic um, thinking and analytical capability behind it. Um, it would have to grow significantly um, to handle it. And probably the hardest part of all would be it would require a cultural change 
um, within everyone there and how they think about it and how external agencies think about it and their relationships with it to start to think about more national security kind of issues, which it's that issue that actually leads me to think that it needs to be a new organization because you can create that culture from day one um, within the people and the relationships between um, a new agency or new center and the other already existent ones and you can establish those new um, cultures and communication structures. And really that in many ways is the hardest thing to do. Um, but if it was the only way um, to defend against these threats, then I, I think that would be another way to do it. We have time for one or two more questions. Yes. Free Bacon uh, website published the article from the Guo Wengui and excited Chinese real estate tycoon turned anti-communist critic. He said, now 99 of the Chinese people in China, include the CCP member, party member, want to see the disappear, this, this disappearance of the CCP, Chinese Chinese communist regime. In fact, the Chinese CCP only served to the facility the top 10 to 20 people of those five to 10 families in China. So when those people are taken down from the power, the communist party will no longer exist. So my question is, do you have some, some good idea to help tear down the, the power of those powers people and release the free market and the environment to Chinese people. I, I wouldn't who have been lying for freedom. Thank you. I wouldn't necessarily consider myself um, an expert on, on that area and able to provide an adequate answer of, of how to do that. Any other final uh, questions? Uh, we, we, we have room for two more, so yes. Hi, Dan Bish, uh, also a concerned citizen. Um, when I think of an economic threat anymore, um, and we kind of talked about monetary policy here a minute ago, to dig deeper into that, no pun intended, uh, our national debt is a bit concerning to me as an emerging economic threat. Uh, your comments, sir. Um, I... Uh, in some ways, this is kind of similar to what the gentleman from Howard brought up in the sense that there is this um, slippery slope issue with what uh, a center like this would address. Um, and, and cost, and but I think it's a real moral dilemma um, in where what is the line that we don't want to cross? And when would such a center start interfering with um, the natural and healthy debates that we have as a democracy and as a nation when it comes to things about like whether we should, what size our national debt should be and things like that. And um, I, I think that's a real, I think that's a real issue. I think part of that would have to be solved again, as I was kind of saying earlier, by um, having the debate up front um, and probably being fairly specific about where those lines were. Um, for me, if you ask me personally, that's probably over the line um, to where something is not going to be very um, helpful for actually um, defending it economic threats. I think the thing I'm proposing is more specific threats um, to companies and to industries in America. Um, but there would probably be pretty blurry areas and, and gray zone areas that we would have to address. And I, I think we do that on a regular basis, as I was saying before, when it comes to um, information threats. And I think we're in the midst of that debate right now, and, and, and um, election threats and things like that, and what should be the role of government and the role of um, military and intelligence agencies in defending against those threats. And obviously, we want to defend against them, but we also don't want to in any way infringe on what, in essence, is the most important thing about our nation and the thing that we're actually trying to protect in the end. So. Um, I suspect that would be a, a big part of it. I would, in terms of my specific proposal, again, what I would suggest is to keep it pretty narrow um, to start, um, and uh, um, and and have um, a, a 
a significant amount of oversight in order to make sure that it doesn't kind of cross the boundary. Maybe not, not to speak for Anthony, but a sense of just specifying the analytical capabilities that we need to refine and to improve upon, right? Because a key part of your idea is that we, we, have, we need to improve in key analytical capabilities that right now private sector firms seem to have, um, and perhaps how can we bring some of that into government? So, um, yes. N uh, yeah, in the bow tie. My name is Dusty Pinion. Um, I'm with the, the U.S. Army, but the, my, my question, um, the debt seems to be something that we've just kind of grown accustomed to. Right? We, we, we live in a, whether we're talking about personal debt or national debt, it's just kind of a normal thing. Um, do you feel like um, we're, it's going to take a watershed moment for this to become a, a, a real problem that the American public is willing to talk about and do something about, uh, perhaps change it, our style, our standard of living, or do you feel like the conversation uh, given the, I guess, the polarity of our society. Do you feel like the conversation is growing to where we're going to get something done about it, or is it going to take a watershed moment to, to bring the economic threat or the economic issue to the forefront? Um, yeah, again, I think, strictly speaking, outside of the scope of, I think, what I'm kind of proposing and, and, and talking about, um, and I, think, I think we do have... Um, in place within our society the mechanisms to have those sorts of debates um, in order to put the right people into government who are going to ha ultimately have control over what that debt size is or anything similar to that. And I would say just, again, personally, um, I think those are the right mechanisms and probably are not something that that a, that a government agency, particularly one that's affiliated with, with, with national security, should really be infringing on. We have to leave a lot to our domestic counterparts. <laughs> yeah. We can't do everything. Yeah. So, um, well, thank you very much. Uh, 401, pretty good military time, ending right on time. I uh, look forward to seeing you at a future event. Thank you. Thank you.